Uh, this is October 3rd, and this is uh, Lesson 5 for Engineering Ethics at NJIT. Um, uh, I guess I'll just, so if anyone has any questions, please stop. I'm glad a lot of people are showing up. Uh, uh, please just interrupt me. Uh, get on the microphone, interrupt me, or talk in chat. I'll try to pay attention as close as I can. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into the lesson. Let me come over here. Oops. Uh, okay, so last week we studied uh, Dennis Joya in the Pinto case, and we talked about the scripts uh, that he operated by. Um, his explanation for why he made the decision that he did was because he was following these scripts. These are corporate scripts that were handed down by the CEO and so on. And he he was trying to explain that the, he made his decisions because he was following the job that was given to him. So last week we talked about following these scripts. Um, this week we're going to talk about breaking scripts. Uh, we're going to be thinking about whistleblowing, uh, deontology. Um, uh, the focus of this week is going to be on whistleblowing and thinking about cases of whistleblowing. When is it appropriate to whistleblow? Uh, if, when it's inappropriate? Um, what are the procedures for whistleblowing? Uh, and, and in the background of this is we're talking about deontology, which is the second of our big ethical theories uh, that we're talking about. We've already introduced consequentialism, which is thinking about the ethics of actions based on the consequences. Uh, deontology is a fancy word for duty theory. Uh, duty, uh, like an obligation or a duty that you have. Um, duty theory, uh, deontology worries about when we have duties, uh, what obligations are like, and when obligations hold on us uh, in certain complex cases. And whistleblowing is a great case of think, thinking about the ontology, thinking about our obligations. Uh, all right, so uh, just to begin with the whistleblower. Um, this is from your book. Uh, whistleblower is someone who exposes illegal, unethical, or dangerous actions uh, or otherwise inappropriate behavior within an organization. Um, and that they expose this information with the intention of taking action so that the dangerous, illegal, or unethical situation is resolved. Um, and they take this action by going outside of the normal channels within an organization, um, either by uh, giving information to a reporter or maybe a, a regulator, a government agency, the police, or any exposure outside of the internal channels within an organization uh, counts as a kind of whistleblowing. Uh, the book talks about four different parts of whistleblowing. Um, it's important that the information is conveyed intentionally. So if you're just like chatting with a coworker and someone overhears something unethical going on in your organization, that doesn't count as whistleblowing. It's, it's leaked information, but you aren't actually blowing the whistle. Uh, whistleblowers are intentionally leaking this information. Um, and it's information about some significant topic of ethical concern. Um, ethical in the broad sense to mean, to include things like safety, safety concerns. Um, so it's not just about something bad happening in an organization, but it has to be a significant ethical problem. So, you know, if someone got fired, uh, they didn't think she could get fired or someone's being a jerk or something. Um, I mean, these might be bad things. These might be ethical concerns, but they might not rise to the level of whistleblowing because they don't represent a significant ethical problem. You know, maybe uh, there are channels to deal with the issues, some more minor issues and ethical uh, and whistleblowing is for these uh, significant challenges that can't be handled within uh, internal channels. Uh, the, the agent who does the whistleblowing is usually an employee or a former employee or otherwise has access to these internal documents. Hey, how's it going? Uh, let me mute that, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Sorry, Emmanuel, I muted you. If you want to come back on and start talking, you can, you can come back. Okay, so the agent is usually an employee or a former employee or otherwise has access to internal documents uh, to make it a whistleblowing case. Um, if you're like an investigative journalist um, and you discover documents from the outside, you're not a whistleblower. Um, whistleblowers are usually from internal within the, the organization. 
Um, and uh, the agent, the whistleblower, gives this information to someone, a person or an organization, who can do something about it. I'm in a position to act. Uh, like I said, usually a regulator, uh, someone who can uh, bring legal charges uh, against the perpetrator, um, or maybe just to a newspaper, uh, a journalist outfit, a news outfit that can uh, report on it in, in ways that are uh, within the norms of uh, journalism about whistleblowing. So there's some organization that's in a position to act to release this information more publicly and to do something about it. Uh, so those are whistleblowers. Um, let's look at some cases of whistleblowing. Um, these are cases from your book. Um, uh, and some of these cases will appear on the quiz. So this is Ernst Fitzgerald. Uh, Ernst Fitzgerald, uh, uh, who's a government employee um, who was working on these Lockheed uh, C-5As. So C-5A was a cargo plane, one of these massive cargo planes. Uh, it was built in the 60s, and uh, these uh, vehicles, uh, these airplanes had huge cost overruns, $2 billion cost overruns, $2 billion in 1968 dollars of cost overruns. It's a huge amount of money. Um, and if you know anything about military uh, technologies, you know that these kinds of cost overruns are not at all uh, rare. I think right now the big scandalous one is the F-35. F-35 uh, is another Lockheed plane. Um, the F-35 uh, costs something like $100 million per, uh, per airplane. $100 million per airplane, and the whole program is something like $1.5 trillion uh, to build. $1.5 trillion, that's enough money to put everyone in the United States through college for free and pay their medical bills, but we're, we're building fancy planes instead. Um, and the F-35 is way over budget also, it's $163 billion over budget, seven years behind schedule. Um, these kinds of huge cost overruns, huge behind schedule uh, d delays, very common is in this military technology uh, because budget usually isn't concerned because they have virtually unlimited funds to do whatever they want. They can spend a trillion dollars, $1.5 trillion on an airplane, and the airplane doesn't even work that well. Uh, the F-35, um, uh, the military wanted it to do uh, takeoff, vertical takeoff, uh, like a helicopter, um, but the technology to actually do the vertical takeoff is so expensive and so heavy that uh, the planes just aren't very good anymore. They don't turn as fast, they're not as good in, in fighter situations, um, and so pilots tend to not prefer the F-35. Even though it's a more advanced technology, it's not as good in the air. So all these overruns, all these delays, huge expense. Very typical. And this has been happening in the military for decades, right? So the uh, C-5A was another one of these cases where um, way over budget, $2 billion over budget. Um, so because it was so far over budget, uh, uh, the Senate decided to call in some people from the military and from the government agencies um, involved with the military uh, to look over these uh, costs I mean, Fitzgerald, Ernst Fitzgerald was called. Um, Ernst Fitzgerald had made a reputation for himself as being against these cost overruns. He, he didn't like that these projects were going way over budget. And he did a lot within the organization to try to keep these projects within budget. Um, and uh, in, including a lot of very uh, uh, frugal decisions that were not popular with his superiors. So Ernst, uh, Fitzgerald had uh, cultivated a kind of uh, bad, uh, bad reputation among his superiors for being too concerned with these costs. Um, and then when the Senate called Fitzgerald to testify about the costs for the C5A, um, he was pressured very forcefully by his superiors uh, to not discuss the overruns, to uh, either lie about it or, or um, try to evade the issue. He was told by his superior officers not to talk about how much this plane was cost, costing, but when he's testifying for Senate under oath, um, and he's asked about the cost overruns, he tells the truth. He says that it costs $2 billion over budget, it's way over schedule, um, and tells everything that's going on. Uh, uh, because he told the truth before Senate, he was uh, 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 reprimanded um, pretty severely. He was stripped of his duties, he was reassigned to bogus missions um, that were just wastes of time. 
Um, eventually, he was accused of revealing classified information uh, for telling the truth to Senate. He was accused of revealing classified information and uh, sought after by the highest levels of government. Nixon is quoted as saying that uh, he wants to get rid of that son of a bitch. Um, and so they fire him, um, strip him of his duties, uh, 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 at great personal cost. Um, uh, his reputation is tarnished. He's not going to have an easy time getting another job in the uh, military industrial complex. Um, he's got a better reputation. Uh, and he fights it. And for years, for four years, and for almost a million dollars in uh, legal fees, he fights this result. Um, and he eventually wins. Um, it's found that all this retaliation is not uh, legal. Um, and he's reinstated in his position eventually after four years and a million dollars in fees. Um, it's a great personal cost. He ends up victorious in this, and he ends up vindicated by history. Um, but it comes at a great cost. And uh, that cost affects not just him, but his family. Um, right? this, is the cha this is really the challenge of whistleblowing. And it's a personal challenge. It's about when does the interests of, this, of the public outweigh your personal interests? Right? And Fitzgerald decided that to, you know, charging the public $2 billion um, without their agreement, without even their knowledge, right, taking this money from taxpayers was not ethical and that he had an obligation to tell the truth. Um, and for doing so, he was severely reprimanded. He got a, a, a severely punished. Now, uh, partly because he decided to take an ethical stand here, um, he's helped future people doing the same thing. So uh, Fitzgerald was instrumental in getting the Civil Reform Act of 1978 passed, um, which laid the groundwork for some whistleblower protections, and eventually the Whistleblower Protection Act of 1989. Whistleblower Protection Act um, pr protects whistleblowers from exactly these kinds of, uh, uh, this kind of vindictive behavior, this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, lashback. There, there's a term I'm forgetting. Um, uh, yeah, so the Whistleblower Protection Act is supposed to protect people from this kind of uh, uh, blowback against whistleblowing uh, in, in order to encourage them to tell the truth. Now, there's problems with this. Whistleblower Protect Protection Act isn't very strong. Uh, to begin with, it only protects government employees. Um, government employees are protected uh, by whistleblower protection. And then only sometimes, um, in cases of classified information or other kinds of sensitive state issues, you're not protected under this act. So. The Whistle Protection Act is it's a weak act, but it's something to protect whistleblowers. And it's really because of what Fitzgerald did back in the 60s and 70s that this stuff uh, gets instated. So Fitzgerald took a stand. He took an ethical stand. I mean, in some sense, he's a bureaucrat, just like Eichmann was a bureaucrat, a paper pusher. Um, but he decided to tell the truth and that it was more important to take an ethical stand than to look after his own career. And because he did it, I mean, not only are the... Uh, uh, not only does the public have a better idea of what's going on with its uh, military budget, um, but that future whistleblowers have some protections. Uh, another case that the book talks about, which is not exactly a whistleblowing case, is the uh, DC-10 case. So DC-10 is a commercial uh, airliner. Um, it's a McDonnell Douglas plane. Um, and, and Dan Applegate was a senior engineer at Corvair. Uh, Corvair was one of the... Uh, contractors with McDonnell Douglas uh, designed to build certain parts of the plane, and in particular, they uh, were in charge of the cargo doors. Um, in 1970, uh, uh, Corvair, the engineers at Corvair, uh, learned that the uh, cargo doors were defective. And they, they'd known about it for a while. And then in, I think, 1972, there was a plane that was downed. Um, it didn't crash, but there was some error with the cargo doors where the light went off and they had to make an emergency landing. Um, and after the emergency landing, Applegate at Corvair decided uh, that this was a big problem and he needed to write it up. And so he wrote up a memo where he uh, called attention to the problem uh, with the cargo doors, uh, described exactly what could go wrong um, in a worst case scenario, um, and then made a recommendation uh, for how to fix it. Right? He had a bunch of designs for how to, how to fix the problem with the cargo doors. Um, and then he wrote this memo and then he showed it to all his superior officers. He called a bunch of meetings. Um, and got a bunch of people to look at these uh, considerations, and they did, but they decided that if, if they follow through with these plans to do the redesign, it would increase the cost and it would delay the, uh, the contract uh, with McDonnell Douglas uh, far too long, outside the terms of the contract, and Corvair decided that was unacceptable. So um, although they knew of these problems, they didn't release this information to McDonnell Douglas. 
Um, and two years later, in 1974, uh, that, that same cargo door problem uh, resulted in a plane crash that killed 30, uh, 346 people just outside of Paris. Now, Applegate never blew the whistle. Um, he didn't let his concerns be known outside of, the, outside of his company. He told Corvair of his problems. Uh, Corvair decided that they didn't want to tell McDonnell Douglas uh, and pass this information on, and uh, uh, nothing w went further than that. So Applegate just sat on this memo. Uh, and it was afterwards when they were going over the crash and what caused it and what went wrong that they discovered this memo. And it was critical in all the lawsuits. They found Corvair responsible uh, for the crash, partly because Corvair knew about it in the memo, showed that they knew about it. So uh, uh, the Applegate story is supposed to be, it's another important story in the history, history of whistleblowing, even though Applegate didn't blow the whistle. Um, he was only working within these internal uh, procedures within his organization. Uh, had he blown the whistle, maybe McDonald Douglas would have found out about it. Maybe they would have uh, made changes to the cargo doors and maybe this plane wouldn't have crashed. So here we have uh, Ernst Fitzgerald successfully um, whistleblowing, telling the truth, um, and getting a bunch of uh, bad results personally for that. Um, then Dan Applegate, uh, no one tells the truth in this one. Uh, they do the memo, but but the information isn't released, and then a bunch of people die. Great. So, so, I mean, so this is this is exactly the challenge. Um, is it worth the personal cost for the interest of the safety, uh, the interest and safety of the public? Um, this is not an easy decision, and it's a personal decision. It has to do with what uh, you yourself uh, are comfortable with doing. Uh, what are you comfortable with taking action on or not? Um, these aren't easy questions. Uh, I think I want to, before uh, we move on too far, I want to talk about the other uh, two other cases, which is the Chelsea Manning case and the Edward Snowden case, which are cases of whistleblowing um, in the news uh, recently. Um, there's, more, there's more cases of whistleblowing that I, I can talk about in a little bit, but let me talk about Chelsea Manning and uh, Edward Snowden first. Uh, so, so Manning was an army analyst. Um, uh, uh, what was in the army was... Uh, uh, was in the army as an analyst um, and had access to a bunch of uh, classified information, including uh, some information that there were big public scandals about. So this is 2005. I'm just going to show this really briefly. Um, in 2005, uh, two Reuters reporters went missing. This is these two guys right here in the center. You see they're carrying something over their, over their shoulder. Uh, and what they're carrying are cameras with telephoto lenses. These are reporters, they're credentialed reporters for Reuters magazine, or for Reuters, which is a, which is a, a major, Reuters and AP are the two major uh, news uh, wire services. So these are, these are credentialed reporters working for a major uh, news outlet. Um, and they're in Baghdad in 2005. Baghdad's a war zone at the time, an active war zone. Um, but there's also a bunch of people living there and so on. Uh, so, uh, these two Reuters reporters go uh, into Baghdad. Um, they end up getting shot and killed in this video. You'll see this helicopter. This helicopter's circling about a mile above overhead. And it sees these guys, sees stuff that they're carrying, and thinks that they're carrying uh, AK-47s and RPGs. Especially, he's looking around the corner. He's looking around the corner here to take a picture with his telephoto lens. Um, but in, in the helicopter, they, they see this, and they think it's an RPG. Um, uh, you know, and, and you know, maybe they really thought it was an RPG. Maybe that was that was an honest call. Uh, in a war situation, things are difficult. War is hell. Um, but so they see it, and uh, they ask for permission. You can see in this video that they ask for permission several times from the security officers, and they get permission, um, and then they light everyone up, um, uh, including the people trying to escape. They just mow them all down. Um, uh, so the the reporters disappear, and Reuters asks after afterwards, you know, where where are they? What happened? And the U.S. military refuses to give them any information. This is all classified information, so they don't say where the reporters went, what happened to them, that we killed them. But all this information is kept secret uh, for years, for years and years. Um, so not only did they shoot at these people, but uh, remember, this is an active city. And after the shooting, uh, the reporter here is trying to get away, crawling on the ground. Um, a van drives up. Yeah, this black bongo, bongo van. Uh, to pick him up and put him in the, uh, to take him to a hospital or whatever. Um, so they're picking up this guy, and you can see that the 
helicopter pilots are also asking to engage, begging to engage. It's important here that they're not just shooting randomly. They're not just shooting at whatever they want. Um, when they see a target they want to uh, engage, they ask for permission and they get for, they get that permission. Right? So this is these are commands that are coming down from above their station. Um, but they see these people helping out and they shoot them up. Also, this is a war crime, by the way. I mean, you're not allowed to shoot at medics. Um, you're not allowed to shoot at people helping. Uh, I don't know if you could see it, but uh, the person whose van this is, their kids are also in this in this van. Like they were just went to go pick this, these people up. And they shoot all these people also. So this is the kind of stuff that the US military does. Um, and they do it uh, under our name, wearing our flag. And uh, these are war crimes. These are uh, illegal activity. Um, but we're not allowed to know anything about it. And in fact, the US government deliberately tries to hide this, hide this information. So Chelsea Manning uh, has access to this information, finds out all this stuff. Um, not only this video, but lots of other information about the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. And leaks it all, leaks it to WikiLeaks. Uh, WikiLeaks, by this point, is an established uh, whistleblowing outfit, um, and they have connections in the major newspaper outlets, uh, New York, the uh, New York Times, uh, uh, The Guardian, Der Spiegel in Germany, a couple of other uh, major news outlets. Uh, that WikiLeaks is working with. And uh, newspapers receive classified information all the time. And uh, it's part of journalistic ethics to be able to look at the information and, and determine what's important enough to publish and release to the public and what is too sensitive or dangerous to release to the public and should be hidden. Right? So the government makes their own decisions about what's classified. But sometimes these documents get leaked to the newspapers. And it's very common uh, historically that this information um, is evaluated by newspapers to be published or not based on journalistic ethics. Um, the most famous case of this is the Pentagon Papers. Um, um, uh, back in the 70s, um, Pentagon Papers were, uh, was a report by the Department of Defense on the uh, Vietnam War, um, and especially about a bunch of uh, bombing campaigns that they did that were never reported in the media. Right, so this is uh, classified information that uh, was about uh, uh, foreign engagements that the military was not telling us about. Remember, Vietnam was a very unpopular war. Um, in the media, lots of people were very unhappy with, uh, with Vietnam, especially after things like the Miley Massacre and so on. Um, and uh, because of this unpopularity, the government was trying to hide this information from the public. Um, and Daniel Ellsberg, who was a journalist, um, uh, got a copy of the Pentagon Papers and decided to uh, report them. Uh, printed them to the New York Times. Um, Ellsberg was charged uh, uh, with theft and conspiracy uh, with these papers, um, uh, violations of the Espionage Act. Um, but uh, he was charged, but he was never convicted. And the judge threw out all the, uh, all the charges, dismissed all the charges. So he was never convicted. He never served any prison time. Um, in fact, he's a celebrated journalist now. He won a bunch of awards. Um, he's a very famous uh, journalist for whistleblowing now. Uh, so uh, Ellsberg um, publishes the uh, Pentagon Papers. Uh, just to complete the history of the Pentagon, it's because Ellsberg published Pentagon Papers that um, Nixon tried to go after Ellsberg uh, uh, at Watergate. Um, yeah, so uh, there was retaliation against Ellsberg personally, um, and they went into... Uh, Watergate, where his, I think it was his psychiatrist, psychologist office or whatever, and they were trying to seal files on Ellsberg to try to slander him and ruin his reputation. And the people who were trying to steal these documents got caught, and that was the Watergate scandal, these, this burglary to try to steal these papers. Um, it got caught, it was Watergate scandal. Um, it was found out that Nixon was personally responsible for this, and that's why he ended up resigning. Um, uh, he was impeached and ended up resigning. Uh, so um, Ellsberg ends up on the right side of this, on the right side of history, he ends up uh, no charges brought against him. Um, the perpetrator, up, up right up to the president of the United States, ends up getting taken out of office because of all this unethical dealings. So, on this same kind of model, Chelsea Manning finds this illegal information, uh, information about war crimes and so on, um, and gives it to WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks uh, themselves uh, talks to a bunch of established media outlets to go over this information and see what can be published. They end up publishing a lot of it, uh, like the collateral murder video and so on. Um, Manning is also brought up on espionage charges, um, but because Manning worked in the army, 
um, she uh, uh, she was brought into a, a military court as opposed to a civilian court, um, and the standards for military courts are much higher. And she was found guilty. So she was charged with aiding the enemy, but she was not found guilty of aiding the enemy. In fact, um, she's been vindicated several times over. The military said that nothing that she leaked put any uh, people's lives at risk um, or any foreign agents' lives at risk. Right? There was no, no one put at risk by this information. Um, a lot of this information was stuff that had happened years earlier, like this, uh, like this uh, collateral murder video. Um, so uh, not charged with aiding the enemy. If she had been convicted for aiding the enemy, that would have served uh, with uh, uh, capital punishment, uh, she could have been put to death. But she was not charged with aiding the enemy. Instead, she was charged with a bunch of other violations of the Espionage Act, and she's now serving a 35-year sentence. Um, uh, durations of the sentence have involved um, uh, solitary confinement um, in extreme conditions. So military has a uh, designation in, in military prison. There's a de designation of uh, uh, prevention of injury. Um, if you're designated prevention of injury, that means that you're uh, at risk of injuring yourself or someone else. Um, and because they determine you at risk, they can do a lot of things like put you in solitary confinement for eight or nine months. I think uh, Chelsea Manning was in solitary confinement for eight months, eight and a half months, uh, alone in a little room with no exercise. In order to exercise, she had to run around in circles in her little room. And if she was running too fast, they would stop her and say, you can't run. Um, so she had to stay in this little room uh, uh, for, for months while they were... Uh, deciding what to do with her. Um, and because she was prevention of injury, for periods of that time, she had to stay uh, completely naked um, because having clothes, uh, you might hurt yourself with your clothes. So they put, they lock you in a room completely naked. This is torture. Um, Chelsea Manning was tortured uh, because she released information that was considered classified. And she's currently uh, serving a 35 year sentence. Uh, she's on hunger strike right now because her condition is the way she's being treated is so poor that she's been on a hunger strike, I think, for a couple of weeks now. Uh, uh, which is, you know, what threatens her life. Um, remember, Chelsea Manning didn't kill anyone. She didn't, she wasn't responsible for anyone's death. Uh, all she did was tell the truth, release information about what our soldiers are actually doing. Um, and she's now serving a 35 year sentence for telling the truth. Uh, Edward Snowden has not been convicted or charged yet, but a uh, very similar case. Edward Snowden was an NSA analyst, very low level, but had access to classified documents. I um, mean, release those documents. Uh, it's because of Edward Snowden that we know the extent uh, of the NSA wiretapping scandal. Um, throughout the 2000s, from about 2003 to uh, after 2010, um, the NSA was, had a widespread uh, wiretapping program where they were collecting all the metadata from all the conversations happening anywhere in the country. Uh, metadata is the information on your phone about who's calling who, at what time, where are they located, or just general information on the phone. So they don't even have to look at the actual content of your phone, they're just, look, they're just capturing all this metadata. I mean, analyzing it to look at patterns of behavior, uh, if you can find you know, terrorist organizations or whatever in this data. Um, so the NSA has been spying on US citizens like this for years. Um, this is illegal. Uh, uh, it's a violation of, uh, it's a constitutional violation. Um, there's no laws uh, justifying this. And it was completely un not talked about. It was a, hit, it was a secret program. Um, for decades, the government policy has been that we, we can spy on other people, but if you spy on anyone in the United States, you need a warrant. You need uh, some uh, court order to make sure that it's okay that you are doing this uh, checks and balances, right? The government has different branches of government. Um, the NSA is under the executive branch and they can go around looking for people. But in order for the NSA to actually wiretap someone, the law used to be that they had to get a, a, a warrant from a court, right? So the judicial branch has some oversight, some checks and balances. <coughs> now, um, the NSA, um, they want their wiretaps and they want them now. Um, and they were able to successfully argue back in the 70s for uh, the establishment of something called the FISA court. Uh, the FISA court was established precisely so that um, in extreme emergency situations, um, warrants can be uh, obtained after uh, going through the wiretap. So um, if the NSA finds someone that they think they want to wiretap and, and they're concerned about time situations, that you know, there's a, there's a bomb about to go off or whatever, um, then the law is under the FISA court that you can start the wiretap and within 72 hours, you have, uh, you have 72 hours from when you start the wiretap to find a court, to find a judge to give you the warrant. And the FISA court was set up so that there's a judge 
whose only job it is is to be on call in case someone needs a warrant, that they can sign off on this warrant. So um, the way the law is, it's designed to make it as easy as possible to wiretap whoever you want. All you need is warrant, and to have a warrant, you need some probable cause, some reason to think that this person is suspicious. The reason the wiretapping scandal that Snowden talks about is so controversial is because even though it was very easy to get a warrant, um, the NSA circumvented that whole process and decided not to get warrants for anyone and just wiretapped um, everyone in the country. Um, I mean, they couldn't get warrants for everyone because they don't have probable cause on everyone, but they wanted all the information. So they were just collecting large sweeps of this data. Um, we had known about this beforehand. Um, uh, um, yeah, so some of the employees at SBC, at the SBC uh, facility in San Francisco, um, they said there was this room, room 641, uh, 641A, uh, and no one had any keys to get into this room. No one knew what was in this room. Uh, and uh, people were suspecting there was something strange going on in this room. And some of, some of the employees at SBC found the internal documents that described all these supercomputers, uh, 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 experimental supercomputers that weren't sort of common, uh, commonly available, were in this room. Uh, huge computers doing lots of processing work. Um, and then they found the the, the designs for this room, and they realized that what's going on is that they were doing wiretapping. Um, and so back in, early on, there was this whistleblowing from employees at SBC that, that there was some, that the NSA was doing something sneaky in this room, but we didn't know what they were doing, and we didn't know the extent of the program. And it wasn't until Snowden, uh, several years later, um, releases all this information, he, and he releases lots of information, uh, PowerPoint slides from meetings and so on, about how this uh, program worked. Um, and so now we have, we know a lot about this program and how extensive it is, and partly because we know a lot about it, the NSA has at least claimed that they've shut down the program, so they're no longer doing this extensive warrantless wiretapping program. Um, but for, for, for years they were doing this program. Um, it's illegal, it's unconstitutional, and so Snowden said something about it. He saw something wrong, he said something about it. Uh, uh, Snowden is also wanted on charges uh, uh, of violation of the Espionage Act. And because he would be arrested if he got caught, um, he's now in a foreign embassy with a non-extradition treaty. So that uh, I think he's in Russia at one of the foreign embassies in Russia. Uh, uh, and he's stuck there. He can't go anywhere else because if he leaves and someone in the U.S. catches him, then uh, he might end up having the exact same result as uh, Chelsea Manning, 35 years in jail. So this is how we treat whistleblowers in the United States. Um, we take away their job, right? we uh, tarnish their reputation, we call them a son of a bitch, we throw them in prison, solitary confinement for 35 years. This is all a lot of pressure against whistleblowing. Um, the rules, the laws that we have, uh, they're not very encouraging to potential whistleblowers. In fact, they're very discouraging. And the social pressure, the social stigma on whistleblowing is very discouraging. Uh, let me go ahead and stop here and see what people think, if anyone has any comments or thoughts, questions. Uh, uh, Edward S. is Snowden, the person who created WikiLeaks. No, um, WikiLeaks had been around for several years before Snowden. The guy who created WikiLeaks is uh, named Julian Assange. Um, uh, where is he? Yeah. Uh, Julian Assange, and he's he was doing WikiLeaks uh, uh, before Snowden came around. So Snowden released his information in 2012. I think uh, Chelsea Manning was in 2010, and Snowden had been doing WikiLeaks since 2006. Uh, WikiLeaks, it was just, it's just an online server where people can dump information anonymously, um, and then they can go over it. Uh, Julian Assange is also wanted by lots of different governments, um, also for character defamation and lots, lots of other things. Uh, uh, so he's also at an embassy somewhere, hiding out. Uh, basically, people don't watch people telling the truth. <laughs> uh, it makes those people in power look bad. Um. 
Is it illegal to view information on WikiLeaks? That's an excellent question. Uh, and um, there's really no clear answer on that question. So uh, before I go any further, let me go ahead and load up WikiLeaks. So you're all watching, look at WikiLeaks. Yeah. Uh, WikiLeaks here. This is WikiLeaks. Um, yeah, these are all the leaks that are being leaked right now um, on lots of different things, uh, the TPP chapter. Um, a lot of the uh, Clinton emails got leaked to uh, WikiLeaks. You can look. You can look through them here, and you can just and you can just look through them. So um, you can search through the emails. Uh, one of the really Uh, one of the really massive things that uh, Chelsea Manning released um, was the war logs, um, Afghanistan war logs. Uh, so, uh, uh, oh, maybe I don't know if they have them up anymore. Um, so, so basically, anything that happens in a wartime situation, someone has to write a report, uh, even like a minor altercation. Um, or just meeting with locals, even if there's no shots exchanged, no fires exchanged. But every time you're under fire or firing back, you have to at least write up a report about what happened, times, and so on. Um, and almost all of those reports for the Afghanistan war um, have been released. And uh, so we have unprecedented information about what happened and when during the Afghanistan war. Yeah, so we know all the different engagements and where they happened. I mean, we were knowing this uh, while the war was going on, and this is the kind of information that we have internally uh, that we've never had in a war before. The world War II, you know, we might get some reports back, but we might not know about it for weeks. The public might not know about it for a long time. I um, mean, this stuff was being released while we were still at war. Um, so I think this is, you might be put on a watch list if you uh, look at WikiLeaks. Well, I mean, that's not... Uh, I mean, that's not, well, so, so uh, if you're put on a watch, so if I'm put on a watch list right now for going to WikiLeaks, so I'm at WikiLeaks right now, but the watch list is being put on uh, the school, right? Uh, what they can tell is that this is coming from the university. Uh, I guess they can also tell it's coming from my computer on the university, but my computer is a school-issued computer. Um, you can trace it back to me, but I can do things to uh, prevent myself from being uh, followed, IP, uh, IP followed. Um, um, uh, it's not likely that you're going to get uh, in trouble, so it's not illegal to view it. This information is all public, you can look at it. But uh, the reason that there's an issue here is because some of this information is classified, and so, uh, and you're not allowed to look at classified information. So uh, if you're getting a job with the government, if you're getting a job with like the FBI, the FBI might ask you if you've looked at WikiLeaks, uh, because that means that you've looked at classified information, and having done so might make you uh, less trustworthy. They might not trust you as much for looking at WikiLeaks. So I've just made you all a little bit less trustworthy by showing you WikiLeaks. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, schools also, um, yeah, so uh, right during the WikiLeaks scandal, this is terrible, but this is, this has actually happened. Uh, Columbia University, um, one of the staff members who works at the uh, International and Public Affairs School at Columbia, uh, sent out a uh, letter to all its uh, all its students saying that if you want to work for the State Department, then maybe you should not look at WikiLeaks. Um, yeah, so it sent out an, an email to all its students saying that you shouldn't look, work at WikiLeaks if, yeah, so uh, we had a call from a CIPA alumnus. He recommends that you do not post links or make comments on social media sites, uh, Facebook and Twitter about WikiLeaks. Such activities might call into question your ability to deal with conf confidential information, which is, part of the, which is part of most positions in the federal government. Right, so the idea is that if they find out that you're looking at WikiLeaks, um, if they find out that you're looking at WikiLeaks, then uh, 
it, it calls into question your ability to handle sensitive information. Now think about that for just a second. Uh, uh, what they're, t they're telling their students in international public affairs that they shouldn't be even researching a story that's absolutely critical to understanding world news and public affairs, international news. I mean, this isn't just WikiLeaks talking about it. This is WikiLeaks working with other major papers like The Guardian and New York Times and so on uh, uh, to release this information. So this isn't just information coming through WikiLeaks. This is information coming through mainstream media sources. But people are advocating that you don't look at this information because it calls into question your ability to handle sens sensitive information. Um, a lot of this stuff isn't as relevant anymore after the email scandal where it, it has become very clear that no one handles sensitive information properly. Right? Uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, um, uh, the investigation into Clinton's handling of the emails made two things very clear. One, she did not handle these emails responsibly. And number two, no one else in her position would handle emails any more responsibly. In other words, she was acting just like everyone else does. Uh, which, I mean, the lesson from this is that our security apparatus, especially at the highest levels of government, is, com is a complete joke. Um, no one takes care of security um, at these high levels. Um, but uh, the pressure isn't on the high levels. The pressure is on uh, students, uh, up-and-coming people. Um, the big lesson is that the government wants you to stay ignorant. Uh, it's, it's, it's better for the government that you stay ignorant on matters of public interest, uh, national interest. It matters that you don't know who we're killing or the war crimes that we're committing, right? Because if you know that we're killing a bunch of people for no reason at all, uh, unnecessarily, if we're committing war crimes, you know, then maybe you support the war less, right? Uh, the military saw this in Vietnam, that uh, public information, public knowledge about war crimes um, uh, kills any public support for the war. Um, so the military would rather you just not know about this stuff. Would rather you stay ignorant. I guess. I guess it's worth talking about the Tiananmen Square uh, massacre here. Um, if you uh, search uh, Tiananmen Square in the United States, so if I tr if I search Tiananmen Square in the United States, um, I get information about the protests in 1989, the massacre that happened in 1989. A bunch of students went to Tiananmen Square to protest. Um, it was a student demonstration, a nonviolent student demonstration. And in response to the nonviolent student demonstration, the uh, China rolled out tanks. Um, uh, rolled out tanks and shot a bunch of people, killed a bunch of people, uh, in order to squash the protest. Uh, while we're talking about this, I can't help but show you Tank Man. Tinkman, this is one of the best protest videos ever. Uh, this is the kind of, it makes me cry every time I see it. He's, he's carrying grocery bags and he's standing in front of tanks. Um, can you hear the audio? Is the audio coming through? No. Audio. Uh, if you can't hear the audio in the background, it's just uh, gunfire in the background. People are getting shot. And this guy stands in front of these tanks, a big long line of tanks, just this guy. And then he climbs, he climbs on the tank. Such bravery. A, a, a mind-bending mind bravery, where you go knock on the door of the tank, unarmed. We don't know what happened to this guy. Uh, we, don't know, we don't know who he is, and we don't know what happened to him after this. He eventually climbs off the tank, 
And then as the tank tries to drive away, Turn around. He runs back in front of the tank. He stops something that he knows is going to be wrong at great personal cost. Um, so uh, if you look up the Tiananmen Square massacre in the United States, you get all these videos of all, of all this protest happening. Um, if you look up uh, Tiananmen Square uh, in China, um, you get something completely different. You get no word whatsoever about the massacre. Um, you get a bunch of just happy pictures of Tiananmen Square. Uh, in uh, in China, they suppress this information deliberately so that the public doesn't know about it. Um, and it's, uh, uh, you, have to, you have to do special things to be able to get this information in China. And the United States works the exact same way where this information we try to suppress, we try to hide, uh, so that the public doesn't know what, what the government is doing. Um, Edward asks, I'm surprised the government hasn't just shut the site down. Well, I mean, they try. Um, they've tried several times. Uh, but uh, the site isn't stationed in the United States, and it can hop around different servers. So in the same way that they try to take down, like, uh, uh, the Pirate Bay every once in a while, and then just pops up somewhere else. Uh, same thing with WikiLeaks. There's a bunch of mirrors all over the place. Uh, it, you can't just take down the thing. Um, so what they try to do is they try to attack Assange. Um, they try to attack the whistleblowers. Um, and they try to discredit it in the public so that no one in the public does anything. I mean, and it's, it's really interesting. Right? So um, in New York... Uh, everywhere you go, you see signs that say, if you see something, say something. In New York especially, uh, uh, New Yorkers help keep New Yorkers safe. If you see something wrong, say something. Right? This, isn't, right, this is the slogan of the Department of Homeland Security. Right? This, is, this is the official slogan of the United States government, that if you see something, say something. Well, I mean, here's a bunch of people who saw something and said something, and they end up getting thrown in jail. Um, discredited, their reputation tarnished. So the moral challenge here is about when to whistleblow. Um, and uh, in the lesson, uh, I have two major, two major papers that I want you to read. Um, this the George article and this Birch article. And in some, some ways, they have sort of opposing views. Uh, I don't have this present totally done, but let me just go through the views really quickly. So uh, the George here is worried mostly about uh, the view that engineers should be moral heroes. Actually, let me start at the very beginning of this essay. Um, he says, uh, uh, the myth that ethics has no place in engineering has been attacked, and at least some places has been put to rest. People now believe that, yes, ethics has a place in engineering. But he says, but another, another myth is starting to emerge in its place. Uh, the myth of the engineer is a moral hero. Um, the saints of the field are whistleblowers, especially those who have sacrificed all for their moral convictions. Um, and uh, DeGeorge is worried that there's this connotation that uh, engineers have a moral obligation to blow a whistle, that they have a moral obligation to put everything uh, personal at risk, uh, willing to sacrifice their jobs um, each day for a principle. Um, and DeGeorge says, this is an unreasonable demand to put on people. Um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't demand that engineers be morally perfect, moral heroes. Uh, and, uh, engineers have a job, and it's their job to do that job. Uh, on, Birch's uh, view that their job is to uh, do their engineering job, and they have some obligation to, uh, uh, if there's some problem that they know of, some serious problem, um, they have some obligation to make it known to their superiors, to internal, uh, to internal channels within the company, to help correct that wrongdoing. Uh, if there's a harm, if there's an uh, unsafe product, um, if there's something illegal or unethical going on. Uh, DeGeorge recognizes that if there's something illegal, unethical, unsafe going on, then employees have an obligation to make that issue known. 
if it's serious enough, then they should make their superiors known, um, and that they should exhaust all the channels within an organization, um, up to and including the board of directors. You know, if your boss ignores you, and you go to his boss, and his boss ignores you also, then you can go right up to the top, to the board of directors, and make your concerns known. Um, DeGeorge thinks that you have an obligation as an employee uh, on the basis of agency loyalty um, to at least do these three things. Um, to make sure that the problems are serious and that you let your superiors know and then you let every other channel within the company know. If these three conditions are met, DeGeorge thinks that whistleblowing is permissible. You're allowed to whistleblow, but you're not obligated. It's not necessary. Uh, and if, if these three conditions are met and you don't whistleblow, you haven't done anything wrong. Just give an example from a different field. It's not quite the same thing, but um, without have it have it be you know, whistleblowing being a duty is um, I used to be a high school teacher, and uh, if you if you see any any even any hint of bullying or child abuse in any way, if you don't report it, um, you're you're accountable as a teacher. You could lose your license and possibly even jail time. Even if it's just like you're not sure. You have to report it. I mean, and the parents are kind of your employer because the parents pay the taxes. So you're actually reporting on the people that are paying your paying your salary, and you're actually required by law to. I don't think same thing as whistleblowing, but you're required by law to basically, you know, possibly get a parent in in major trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you don't know for sure that anything's happening, I mean, uh, if if you see bruises, like if you see bruises on their arm or something. They could have gotten those bruises anyway, playing football or whatever. But if you suspect that there's an issue, you have an obligation as a teacher to let someone know. And it's usually you let the counselor or whatever the principal know, um, and they handle it uh, from there. So that's letting people know within the channels of the organization. right? Um, uh, so that's not whistleblowing yet. Whistleblowing is once you've exhausted the channels of the within the organization, do you step outside of that organization? Uh, uh, I just think that, that whistleblowing should be protected under the same type of laws where it's like if you don't whistleblow you could actually get in trouble it should be an obligation protected by the law that if you actually just let things go even if they're not totally um you know, directly related to your your uh, action in the in the matter you should be brought up on charges like the like the pinto case you know yeah, good. So, and and uh, and DeGeorge here is talking explicitly about the Pinto case. His worry is that you know should the should the engineers at Ford have done something different? Should they have blown a whistle and let their issues be known? Um, and DeGeorge, his answer to this is no, they shouldn't have. They did everything they were supposed to be doing, because what they did was they let their superiors know. They exhausted available channels within the company. Um, let me go ahead and quote this. This is from uh, DeGeorge's article. He says, uh, so you know. Given the fact about the Pinto, what do we say about the Ford en engineers? Where were they when all this was going on, and what was their responsibility? And Deirdre says, the answer I suggest is that they were, they were where they were supposed to be, doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were performing tests, designing the Pinto, making reports. Um, in the Ford situation, no engineer was told to produce a gas tank that would explode and kill people. The engineers were not instructed to make an unsafe car. Right? So they weren't deliberately being immoral. Um, uh, in fact, they were doing their job, which is worry about safety concerns, and they were doing all of that. Um, so George says, uh, engineers and large firms have an ethical responsibility to do, do their jobs as best they can to report their observations about safety um, and improvement of safety to management. But they do, not have the they do not have the obligation to insist that their perceptions or their standards are accepted. They're not paid to do that. They're not expected to do that. And they have no moral or ethical obligation to do that. So uh, George says, I mean, if you have concerns, make them known. That's your first obligation, and that's just basically basic agents, agency loyalty. Um, if your concerns are discussed by, by your superiors and they don't do anything about it, well, you've done everything that you are required to do, um, so you don't have to do anything more. Um, uh, DeGeorge says, I mean, you can whistleblow if you want. It's fine, but it's not necessary. DeGeorge thinks that two additional conditions have to be met for whistleblowing to be necessary, to be uh, oblig obligatory. Uh, not only do you have to exhaust all internal channels, but you also have to have documented evidence that would convince an impartial observer that you are right in your concerns and that your company's wrong. Right? So you need to have the documents that show that your company's doing something wrong and that those documents would convince anyone looking. 
that the company's doing something wrong and that you're right to whistleblow. So you need to have the evidence available. You also have to have evidence that by going public, you will prevent the harm from happening, right? or, or uh, prevent the wrongdoing from taking place. I right? see. So you have to have evidence that uh, that will convince anyone that the company's wrong and you're right, and that by going public, you will actually correct uh, the, the damage. Only under those additional two conditions does George think you have an obligation to whistleblow. Um, he says, uh, requiring uh, engineers who don't have all of those conditions met, all five of those conditions met, the whistleblower is making them uh, do more than what they're obligated to do. Right? They're not paid to go above and beyond um, these channels. So, so uh, to go back to the uh, teacher uh, suspecting uh, child abuse, so, I have, so let's say I have a student in my class who has bruises on their arm, um, and I suspect you know, might, this might be from, a, from an abusive parent. Um, and the school policy is that if I suspect child abuse, I have to go report it to the school counselor. And the counselor calls a meeting and they, they discuss it. And so I do that. I, I tell, tell the counselor that I suspect child abuse. Um, and the counselor calls a meeting with the child, maybe with the parents, um, talks about it with the principal and so on. But they decide that, no, you know, in fact, this, uh, this is not an issue. Uh, and the child's fine. And uh, no action is going to be taken. And so that's what the, the board decides. Uh, so let's say after this, I decide that, you know what, the kid really is in danger and that the board wasn't, um, didn't make the right decision. That in fact, the kid really is in danger and that I need to do more than just what I've already done. Um, instead of just reporting to the counselor, maybe I think I need to report it to the police. Or maybe I need to talk to a, a reporter or something, if, if the case is bad enough. Um, this is where I'm going, where I'm whistleblowing. And what George is saying is that, um, I have no obligation whatsoever to do this additional step. Um, but what George is saying is that my obligation, in this case as a teacher, is to make my concerns known within the organization, which is to let the counselor know. And the, you know, there's procedures that the counselor follows for investigating it. Let them handle those procedures. That's not, what I'm, that's not my job. I'm a teacher. I'm not supposed to be handling these abuse cases. My only obligation here is to let someone know that this is an issue. And once they handle that issue according to their procedures, then I'm released from my obligation. I've done everything I need to do. If I do anything beyond that, then I'm going beyond my obligations um, into something super auditory, uh, something that's not necessary to do, but you know, maybe it's a good thing. You know, if I'm actually concerned that there's a real problem here and I call the police, um, you know, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe calling the police does help, but maybe not. Um, to George's point is just that I don't have an obligation to do this additional step. And same thing for whistleblowers. If you've exhausted all the internal uh, resources, and you don't think that going any further will do anything to change it, then you've exhausted your obligations. You've done everything you need to do. And DeGeorge says that in the Ford case, this is exactly what happened. The engineers knew of the problem. They wrote their reports up, and they made their problem known. And the fact that Ford went through with releasing the Pinto anyway, that was on Ford as a corporation, and in particular on the managers who made that decision. But that was not an engineer's decision. And so the engineers shouldn't be held accountable. Uh, they were under no obligation to blow a whistle, is what DeGeorge says. What about the uh, criteria of, like, if you're an engineer and you get your professional license, um, does anything in a licensing say that that if you do anything, like, like if you don't whistleblow and because of the company who's doing something bad, that even though the company may not um, give you any penalties or the government may not give you any penalties, can you lose your license? There's the ethic code of the licensing? Uh, if there's a significant ethical violation. And, and uh, j just, just for the record, um, it's usually the state laws on licensing follow whatever the professional society says. So um, state laws are based on what the engineering professional society say and about their own code of ethics. So the way this usually works is that uh, if there's some ethical concern about some engineer with a license, then that's given to the professional society to do an investigation. Um, and then whatever the professional society says is usually what the, the lawmakers go along with. Um, so, so these two things are pretty closely tied. So according to the professional ethics, I, I think you could actually, even though you weren't necessarily the one causing a problem, but if you knew about it and you didn't whistleblow or you stayed with the company, even though you knew some of the various activities were going on, then you could lose your license, I would think. Yeah, in some, in some cases. And I mean, so, I mean, so, there's, I mean, so there's a challenge here of, of how, so there's lots of interpretations here that have to go on. So how serious is it? Is it a really big problem or is it a minor problem? Um, one of the challenges a whistleblower has to do is figure out how serious the problem is and whether it rises to that level. Of, I mean, so uh, uh, take something like the um, VW emission scandal. 
Uh, no one's dying over that. All right, well, I mean, if they're dying, they're dying over like geological timescales. Right? It's, it's causing the the extinction of the species. But that's not the same thing as killing anyone individually. Right? So um, no individual person is dying over these things. Uh, is that serious enough to whistleblow? How do you tell when it's serious enough to whistleblow? And that's not a safety concern, but there's ethical concerns there. Right? Um, uh, I think a lot of this is going to have to do with how serious it is. If the, if the person doesn't think it's serious, uh, then maybe they don't have the same obligations. Um, the, the code of ethics, um, it, talks, it, it doesn't talk about whistleblowing in particular, but it talks about uh, honesty, safety, and it talks about how to hold different people in the organization accountable. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no discussion of whistleblowing here. Um, it does say that uh, you need to you need to make all of the relevant parties aware of any concerns, including the legal, including the regulatory authorities. Um, so, uh, the de facto position in the NSP Code of Ethics is for honesty, uh, it carries off in an objective and truthful manner, and that means not withholding important information. So, if if you're found withholding important information, then that's a violation, but 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 again, the the Pinto case is a strange case here because the engineers were not withholding information. They had their reports, they had their safety concerns, and they made all that stuff known. They told everyone who was in a position to do anything about it. Um, and if Ford decides even still to ignore their requests, right? The question is, does the does the blame fall on the engineers in this situation? And and George is going to say no. George is going to say no because. Um, the engineers might not have the documented evidence that would convince an impartial observer. So maybe an impartial observer looks at this evidence and thinks that, well, that's not really enough to issue a recall. That's not really enough to blow a whistle. I mean, how do you know what's going to convince an impartial observer? How do you know what evidence is going to be enough to actually prevent the harm from happening? This is Birch's uh, response. So um, in the lesson, there's the George gives these criteria for whistleblowing. And they're very strict criteria. They're very strong criteria. The standard for whistleblowing is very high. You have to jump through a bunch of hoops and tell George thinks that you have an obligation to whistleblow. And Birch's response, I don't have this up on the Prezi yet, but uh, Birch's response is to say that the, the bar for whistleblowing should be much lower. It should be a lot easier to blow a whistle. Um, and in particular, these two final conditions, conditions four and five from uh, DeGeorge, um, Birch argues that these two conditions are too strong uh, that they'll never get met. Um, uh, how would an engineer ever know that an impartial observer will determine that they're right or wrong? Um, so like, imagine I'm an engineer and I have the, the layout for the uh, gas tank design for the Pinto, and I just showed it to a, a random person, uh, an impartial observer. Um, you know, that person might not realize that that gas tank design is unsafe, or might, re might not realize that there's a better way of doing it. Right, so, uh, it, it, uh, so Birch worries that an engineer is never going to be in a position to make this determination that, in fact, it would convince an impartial observer. On top of that, there's this challenge of actually getting the documented evidence. You know, maybe I know that the company is doing something wrong, but I just don't have access to any of the documents that will prove it. Um, on George's account, that means that I shouldn't blow the whistle. You might think that if I know that there's something going wrong, I should blow the whistle, even if I can't prove it directly, because you know, maybe someone else will. Maybe blowing the whistle will help that happen. I don't. I don't agree with all his all his uh, criteria, but I like the fact that he's actually trying to structure such a big concept of whistleblowing. Like what's right, he's actually you know gives an engineer who's usually a very logical person. He's giving them a set of steps to actually meet, even those steps I think need to be refined. It's like a checklist, which I think engineers kind of like to follow. You know, like oh, okay, I could do this, this, so they don't. It kind of takes the. Uh, the morality or ethics out of it. It's just like another procedure that you have to follow, which I kind of like that idea of, you know, making something ethical, uh, procedure based. Procedure based. Yeah. Um, and it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. And, and in fact, that's really what Birch's problem with the George's criteria are, is that there's just too much guesswork, guesswork about what counts as serious, guesswork about what would convince an impartial observer, uh, guesswork about whether going public will actually prevent the harm. Um, I'll put this up on the president later, but uh, Birch's response is to say that, um, what the engineer's obligation is, is to try as much as they can to prevent harms. I mean, that means going public, even if you don't know with certainty that it'll prevent the harm, you should still go public, but you should, you should try. 
Um, uh, t so, uh, Taylor says, uh, uh, if there are no guaranteed safe avenues to whistleblow, you can't force or expect people to do it. Um, yeah, so no one here is talking about forcing people to do it. Um, but we're talking about obligations. So when it's, uh, especially moral obligations, maybe even legal obligations, um, when uh, you're expected to do it, when it's necessary to do it. And the claim here is that if the, if the harm is extreme enough, um, then you might be expected to do it. Now, uh, I, I, I definitely like this, this idea that uh, it's the procedure that helps, it helps take a lot of the guesswork out of it. And the book, I think, has a, a better checklist than the Georgia's Five Conditions. Um, let me move over to the, yeah, so the book has some common sense procedures for uh, leading up to whistleblowing. Um, so let me just go through these just for the procedural, the benefit of the procedure. So uh, the, the big point that everyone emphasizes is work through the normal organizational channels. Make sure that you talk to your boss, talk to, you know, go through whatever other grievance procedures there are within your organization. Um, you shouldn't whistleblow as the first avenue of defense. It should be the last avenue of defense after you've exhausted all the other available channel, channels. Um, be prompt in expressing objections. Right? Don't just sit on an objection for a long period of time. When you have objections, make them known. Uh, the faster you, you express these objections, the uh, more likely it is that something's going to be done about them. Uh, keep your objections tactful, uh, low-key. Be considerate about the feelings of others and avoid personal criticisms. Um, we talked about this a little bit last time in just maintaining an ethical work environment. Uh, the more you attack a person, the more you attack a person's characters, uh, the more defensive they get and the more hostile they get and causes more conflict. So try to focus on the issues um, and try to be aware that uh, criticisms uh, hurt other people's feelings and make people hostile. Um, right. If, if your concern is with an unsafe product, um, then uh, don't let your hatred of particular people or your, your distaste of particular people get in the way of that. Um, the book says, as much as possible, keep its superiors informed of your actions. Um, it also says, uh, consult colleagues and avoid isolation. Um, these are all very difficult and challenging. Uh, uh, in the Bradley Manning case, part of the reason that Manning got caught was because she was talking to one of her peers. She was worried about what she was doing. She wanted to talk to someone about it. And then her peer ended up uh, ratting her out, snitching. Uh, uh, right, so there's this challenge of how much can you actually talk to your superiors without getting in trouble before you even have a chance to whistle blow. Um, Edward Snowden was the same thing. If Edward Snowden had told his superior officers about his concerns about the wiretapping program, he would have had all his privileges revoked, so he would have never been able to leak, leak the information in the first place. Right, so telling your superiors, um, it might be important for going through the normal channels, but it might also get you in trouble before you can do anything about the problem. So uh, these, this is a balance, a balancing act between things. Uh, keep formal records, keep document all, especially if you think that there's some legal issue going on uh, where it might get brought up before a, a government panel, before a judge. Keep records of everything. Document everything that you do if you think this stuff is going to uh, blow back in your face. Document everything you do and always be thinking, um, is this action the kind of thing that I can defend in front of a panel scrutinizing me for ethics? Um, I ask myself this all the time when I'm preparing these lessons, uh, because sometimes we go over very controversial stuff. Just a few minutes ago, I showed, a, showed you guys a YouTube video of a bunch of people dying. Um, and I, and uh, is this ethical? Well, you have to ask yourself, uh, one of the things you should ask yourself when you're asking is ethical is, can you defend this if you're being challenged, if you're being challenged by a superior, um, if you're being cha challenged from, in front of the public, in front of the court? Um, and the easiest way to make sure that you can defend this in front of a court is if you keep records, if everything that you do is documented. Uh, I, I really like the, the, the case that was mentioned earlier about uh, teachers and children, because there's a lot of rules about how teachers uh, should deal with children and about uh, documenting anything that goes wrong with children. I teach at a summer school over the summer with uh, high school students. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a camp, so they're there all day in dorms at night and so on. Um, and having high school students in a dorm environment can be very dangerous. Um, uh, there's safety concerns, there's also uh, reproductive concerns. Um, and all of these are issues that we as their legal guardians have to keep track of. Um, I'm just the instructor, I'm just in the classroom with them, so I'm not in the dorm rooms, and I don't have to keep uh, watch of a lot of the personal situations. 
But if any of those personal situations leak over into the classroom, I also have to be aware of it. And um, my policy as a teacher is just document everything. There's a form you fill out um, if you have any concern at all. I, the form doesn't get anyone in trouble. Um, it's not like a, a detention slip or whatever. Um, but if you have just any concern about a student in any way, uh, as soon as I have that concern, I write it down and I put it in their box. Um, most of the time, nothing ever happens from it. But if anything does happen, at least I've been documenting. Um, if I haven't been documenting my activity, then it becomes my word against someone else's word. And that's when things get really dangerous. But if I'm documenting everything I, I'm doing, uh, uh, it, it protects me um, from these kinds of situations. Uh, the real big protection is get a lawyer if you're ever in serious concern about the stuff. Um, you might also talk to a professional ethics committee um, I'm in, in, in these situations. Uh, so hopefully these, these kinds of procedures help you think um, if you're in a situation where you uh, realize that there's some ethical decision to make, hopefully this procedure can help you sort of uh, uh, center yourself so you know what you're doing and you can, you can make a, a decision, a fully informed and a careful decision as opposed to an uninformed and hasty decision. Um, on, the, on the website for this week, I'm hoping that a lot of the discussion is about these conditions for whistleblowing, uh, when it's okay to whistleblow, when it's not okay. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, so I, I'd like you to talk online about these conditions for whistleblowing, whether it's okay, whether the Georgia is very steep conditions on whistleblowing or whether Bursch is lower conditions for whistleblowing. I mean, uh, I, I forgot to say this earlier, DeGeorge thinks that the conditions should be very high because he thinks whistleblowing should be very rare. He thinks that if you whistleblow too much, um, you uh, threaten to damage the company that you're whistleblowing against, right? If they keep getting a bunch of bogus accusations, uh, then it might hurt the company's reputation beyond what's necessary. So uh, in order to not hurt the company's reputation, whistleblowing should be rare. Also, uh, DeGeorge argues that if we whistleblow all the time, then maybe the effectiveness of whistleblowing as a preventative concern uh, goes down, right? Boy who cried wolf. If too many people are crying wolf, uh, then maybe no one pays attention when it's really important. So DeGeorge thinks that the condition should be very high and the whistleblowing should be very rare. It should rarely happen. Uh, but Birch thinks it's exactly the opposite, that the bar should be very low and that people should be encouraged to whistleblow as often as possible. Birch argues that if uh, people are encouraged to whistleblow, then maybe this puts pressure on the companies to not do unethical things um, that risk whistleblowing in the first place. Um, so maybe that's a way of keeping people in line, or keeping companies in line. So are, um, are, are uh, lawsuits a form of whistleblowing? Because doesn't that keep companies in check? Like, let, let's say with the Ford Pinto case, you, know, you sue. It, I mean, I guess it's not whistleblowing. I, I guess it's a form of check and balance for companies like lawsuits and, and damages. Yeah, um, th that's good. So uh, it's usually so good. So th it's usually the whistleblower isn't themselves the victim of the issue that they're trying to bring attention to, um, right? So the Ford engineers at Pinto are uh, working on the Pinto. They weren't killed by the Pinto. They didn't have any personal damages by the Pinto, but it's just because they had this special information that they wanted to let know. Uh, so usually these don't come out in court cases, but if whistleblowing happens, whatever documents at least end up being important in whatever court cases come up. So uh, the Pinto memo that Mark Dowie found and reported in Mother Jones um, ended up becoming an important issue in the court cases on all the people that died. Right, same thing in the DC-10, the Applegate memo ended up becoming an important legal document in the lawsuits coming afterwards. Um, most whistleblowing is either to a government regulator, a government agency, or the police or something like that, um, or it's to a newspaper, a, a public uh, agency that's going to uh, push the information out. Yeah, if you're bringing a lawsuit, the lawsuit isn't itself the whistleblowing, although it might use uh, documents obtained by whistleblowing. Um, but if you're doing a lawsuit, that's already moving outside the company uh, expected channels. Um, I have like, uh, so in, in just like 10 minutes that I have left, um, I want to just uh, just introduce the deontology part of this, the sort of theoretical part of this. I know engineers don't sort of like the theory stuff as much, but uh, I like theory. Deontology is duty ethics. Um, studies the uh, ethics of duty, profession, obligation. 
Um, the ontologists are more concerned about the right over the good. So uh, the consequentialists are concerned about the good. And consequentialists, if they're utilitarians, they think the good is uh, pleasure, absence of pain. And so the utilitarians argue that you should maximize the good, means most pleasure for the most people, least pain for the least, for the, for the least people. Um, deontologists think that sometimes the right outstrips the good. Sometimes the right is more important than the good. That there are some moral principles that should be followed even if they end up causing pain or pleasure. Right, so uh, this is, it's a good theory talking about deontology because uh, like uh, 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 Fitzgerald, Ernst Fitzgerald in the C5A, um, the question is, uh, do I tell the truth or, uh, and risk a bunch of uh, negative consequences for myself, losing my job and having a bad reputation, getting fired? Um, so that's a lot of pain that's caused. Um, but but the, uh, and you might think very little pleasure is caused by telling the truth. I mean, maybe some pleasure is caused by telling the truth, but probably not as much pleasure as the pain caused by losing my job and so on. Um, but uh, the deontologist can say, but it doesn't matter how much pleasure you feel. What matters is that you did the right thing. And telling the truth is the right thing, even if it's painful. Um, so uh, I have a bunch of other stuff that I wanted to talk about with respect to um, uh, deontology. I want to go over Manuel Kant and talk about the ways of card selection task. And then I'll do these in the live lecture if you have a chance to go to the live lecture. Um, but the, the case I want to talk about here is, is the noble lie. Um, so the noble lie is supposed to be one of these cases where, uh, well, lying in general, the white lie. So, so the case I give on the uh, website on Moodle <coughs> is, your, is your grandmother uh, knits you an ugly Christmas sweater for Christmas uh, and then asks you if you like, if you like your sweater, if you like your gift. And uh, you're deciding whether to tell the truth or whether to lie. Uh, and you hate the sweater. It's itchy, it's uncomfortable, you're never gonna wear it, it looks ugly. Uh, so you hate the sweater. Um, and the truth, if you tell your grandmother the truth, you would tell her that the sweater is awful, you never are gonna wear it. And it was a big waste of time for her to even make it. Um, but you know that if you tell her this, it'll hurt her feelings. Uh, she'll feel sad, she'll feel like, you know, you don't appreciate her. And you don't want any of that to happen. So instead of telling her that you hate the sweaters, even though you do hate the sweaters, um, you, you instead tell her that you love the sweaters and you can wear it all the time. And it's your favorite piece of, piece of clothing and so on. Or you tell her a lie. It's a noble lie designed to protect your feelings. Uh, designed to uh, prevent uh, bad feelings from helping, or designed to keep the peace. Um, and so the question is, is it a noble lie ever worthwhile? Um, uh, utilitarian is going to say, obviously, noble lies are sometimes good. Um, you know, you would hurt her feelings a whole lot if you told her the truth. Um, but you'd make her really happy if you told her the lie. Um, you, wouldn't feel, you wouldn't feel too bad yourself telling her the lie. You know, you might feel a little bit bad, but she would feel a lot better. Um, and she would feel a lot worse if you told her the truth. So from a utilitarian perspective, it might be better to just tell a lie. In other words, a utilitarian is going to say that you ought to lie in a case where it's going to uh, cause the greatest increase of pleasure for the most people. But you might think, on the other hand, that lying is always wrong, and it doesn't matter if you save people's feelings. Um, the point isn't about how people feel. The point is that lying is wrong. You know, uh, if I tell uh, my grandmother that I love the sweater, then maybe she makes another one next year, and another one the year after that, and then I have a bunch of sweaters that I don't want. Uh, and it's just a big waste of time. I mean, my grandma doesn't have too many years left. Why should she waste all this time on these sweaters that no one wants? Right, so maybe it's better, it's encouraged out of respect for her, out of respect for her time uh, and her feelings. Maybe I should tell her the truth. And maybe telling her the lie is a way of disrespecting her. Um, Immanuel Kant argues basically this point, um, that we have an obligation to lie, and that uh, uh, I mean, we have an obligation not to lie, and that lying to others is a way of abusing others and disrespecting others. And so even in cases where uh, you can prevent uh, great harm to someone's feelings, for instance, um, you should still not lie, you should still always tell the truth. Uh, so I want you to think about that. Is that the case? Should you always tell the truth? Or is it okay to lie to spare someone's feelings? I've taken on the philosophy, I guess, a long time ago that, that like, as a scientist or a philosopher or engineer, like, the truth is paramount. Um, even if those cause damage, because otherwise you're just creating a, a false reality. And, you know, that, that goes into like, you know, people that are really uh, dependent on religion or, or some kind of um, 
delusion of themselves. And um, like with example of telling a lie to say somebody's feelings, you're just enabling a certain behavior in them possibly. Like if you're going out with somebody and you're, you're constantly like just inflating their ego, they're never going to grow as a person. And you're kind of, I see as a disrespect to them as you're basically just saying, well, you know, I really don't think this is of quality, whatever the issue is, but you know, I just don't, I think it's actually a selfish thing to lie because you're just trying to avoid the feeling of you being guilty, feeling guilty for maybe hurting somebody's feelings. But in the long run, I think the truth will, the person will benefit from you telling the truth possibly. Do you think this is the case even with my grandmother and the ugly sweater? Um, because I mean, uh, I'm not trying to lie to my grandma about everything, but during the holiday season, you know, maybe it's better to not have the fight. Um, Professor, there's a way to tell your grandmother the truth in a way. Uh, first, I would agree with Edward what he's saying. It's not, you shouldn't lie, because in the long run, it will hurt down the road. Um, Short term wise, it's personally, I would think it's just better to tell the truth. Even does if it means um, not sparing feelings and stuff, you're probably best to tell the truth and avoid future fights and stuff. Because it will get worse once you start lying. Good. Although, just just a, a philosophical point, um, the claim that it will get worse in the long run is still a utilitarian argument, right? That it's still based on cost-benefit analysis. It's just you have to do it over the long run. Um, and it's really important that the deontologist is not doing a cost-benefit analysis. They're not saying that over the long run, uh, everything will be better uh, if you tell the truth. They're saying that even in cases where um, things won't get better, things bad things will happen from telling the truth, you should still tell the truth. Um, and Immanuel Kant uh, goes all the way with this. He, he's totally committed. Um, uh, uh, the, the cases of the... Yeah, so, so imagine it's World War II and I'm um, hiding Jews in my basement uh, to escape the Nazi police. Right, so if the Nazis come by and they find these Jews, they're going to capture them and take them off, uh, kill them somewhere. And in order to prevent that, I hide the Jews in my basement. Um, so then, and then the cops come by um, and they ask me, hey, are you hiding any Jews in your basement? Uh, and well, what do I say? Well, I, I, uh, you know, I might think I, I should lie to the police so that way they don't kill these people. Because if I tell them the truth and they're going to capture these people and kill these people, the small little lie shouldn't be outweighed by the loss of these people's lives. But Kant says... Uh, Kant says exactly the opposite. He bites the bullet here and says, no, I mean, even in this case, you should tell the truth. So you have an obligation to tell the truth. Um, I mean, that's maybe actually, the, yeah. That's actually a scenario that really challenges, I guess, I never really put it in that, in that context. Now you say it like that, uh, you just, you just kind of turn my whole philosophy upside down because yeah, I never really put it in those contexts. Yeah, I just kind of maybe uh, am a direct person, you know, causes some maybe awkward moments with people, but I never thought about, you know, holding myself to that standard of truth telling, uh, you know, we're actually going to get people killed if I tell the truth. I never really thought about that. I, I mean, it's, a, it's an extreme case. Uh, and sometimes these extreme cases yield uh, contradictory intuitions. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe your intuition was fine in normal cases, but in an extreme case like this, maybe it changes. Um, uh, but, but I don't think it's an unreasonable case for us to be thinking about in engineering ethics classes, because in some of these decisions, lives really do hang in the balance, right? Uh, whether or not to recall that Pinto could have saved a few dozen lives, or whether or not to recall the, the DC-10 could have stopped that plane from falling out of the sky. Um, right, so uh, it's, sometimes lives do rest on the, on the telling of the truth here. Um, and and it, it, these, are hard, these are hard questions, hard issues. Um, I guess we just have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis and, you know, don't apply any one philosophy or ethical theory. You got to just apply the theories that work for you in that moment. I don't know if I could agree with that. It, I think you would have kind of like a universal belief of, like, you hate, for example, if you hate evil and you love good and stuff. So then your philosophy will always stick to that, but it's going to change in decisions. So with the Jew case you know that the good of the situation is not telling them where the Jews are hiding because you know what they're going to do. A hundred percent, they're going to kill them and you can prevent that. So it's how you, um, I guess, look at the case. And 
also not saying just how you look at a case one way doesn't mean you're totally 100% correct. Sometimes you need maybe three other views to like how they're looking at the case. So. Good, good, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, that, that's uh, one thing I really want to emphasize here is that we're going over deontology as a second ethical theory. Um, it's not going to be, and we're going to go over one more ethical theory uh, next week. Um, it's not the point in any of these ethical theories to say that this is the right theory. Um, I don't think any of these theories are completely right. Um, the point here is just to think about different ways of thinking about these issues. And that, you know, some people, uh, some people are entirely motivated by the good, uh, pain and pleasure, what are the results? Um, but that these, this isn't the only motivation that people can have for making a decision, and that there's other decisions that might influence how people make, uh, there's other reasons that people might have for making different decisions that don't just emphasize the good. So uh, the point of uh, thinking about deontology is not to say that deontology is correct, uh, but to say that this is another method for evaluating the ethics of these cases. Um, there's a lot more to talk about with this, but I hope you can have that conversation on uh, the website. Um, if you want to talk about Kant and deontology at all, I would strongly recommend you come to one of the live lectures for the next, uh, uh, over the next few days. But uh, until then, I think I'm done with everything. Thank you everyone for uh, showing up, having a conversation. Uh, the questions, everyone. Oh, the secret word. Um, uh, duty. Duty. D-U-T-Y. Duty. Yeah, duty. Uh, so if you type that into the uh, sign-in sheet, you should get credit for this week's lesson. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I'll see you all next week. All right. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Professor.